Um, recently, UNHCR, we, we, we published two documents that I think are not bad. One is um, the organization as itself, not related to health, has published an urban, urban uh, refugee policy. It's taken over 15 or maybe even 17 years to do. And one of the reasons is UNHCR is a protection agency, and one of the big problems has been um, what do you do with urban populations? How do you address them? And also, there's a, there are protection issues. Many times, governments do not allow refugees, here at Dumi refugees, into non, um, on, beyond camps. And so if you start finding and then helping these people, are governments going to arrest them? What's going to happen? Now, that used to happen a lot in Nairobi, with the Somali refugees, until the Refugee Act. Kenya. So recently we have uh, released an urban policy, and then we follow this up with an urban health policy now. And we have three main areas, and I'm going to talk about the last one. But the first one clearly is, is advocacy, and we have a whole area, what do you do, and of course all of this relies upon data. But how, what do we need to do, us, but also this is a very good example where we can work um, with WHO in particular. In many other areas, we haven't worked closely with WHO because they're not in the areas that we work in, the <coughs> flung areas of, of the country. But in urban settings, um, WHO already has all of the links with the Ministry of Health. UNHCR's main partner, unfortunately, is often the Ministry of Interior because they, we, this, we're a protection agency who have foreigners on your soil. So here is a great example where I think WHO, UNICEF, and UNHCR can work more closely together. And the big issue here is to advocate for refugees, for IDPs, for stateless people to have access to existing services. The other issue is at, at a, a either no cost or a very similar cost to what uh, the local populations have. And in middle income countries, that gets extremely difficult because in Jordan, for instance, Syria is easy, socialized country. Um, most of the population has access to free health care at, at a decent level. In Jordan, and then even in Lebanon, Lebanon's worse than in the States. It's, uh, it's so privatized that it's extremely difficult to say what, is, what does the average citizen in Lebanon have and then what can we give to these populations. In Jordan, it's, um, you have a, uh, a health insurance system. So how do we deal with uh, refugees or IDP? IDPs are citizens, but refugees in particular how do, what sort of system do we give? What sort of prices do we ask the government to give to the refugees? And then do we find the money to pay them somehow? <coughs> so it gets very complicated in middle income. The next aspect is support. And this gets complicated because many of these countries, of course, the, the um, existing <coughs> systems are insufficient for the nationals. So now we have a huge burden, Jordan, uh, Jordan and Syria in particular. I mean, if you can imagine at one point, in, in this country, you have 10% of your population, an additional 10% of people, foreigners, all of a sudden uh, dealing with a socialized system you know, here in Denmark or where I'm from in Canada. You have 10% in increase. You're, the population won't deal with this, but you know, the existing services won't deal with this very well. In Jordan and Syria and other countries, or in, in, of course, many of the African countries and Asian countries, the systems aren't working brilliantly to begin with, and then you have a huge um, influx. So how do you support the existing systems? And that can be from, and we're talking here not just health, but education. So what do you do? By building schools, by, uh, hiring more doctors, that sort of thing. So the, the next part of the strategy is support. And then what I want to talk about here is the, the third part, is really documentation, assessment, monitoring, and evaluation. And as I said, these urban areas, these are quite complicated. It's much, much easier in camp situations. So the first challenge is trying to um, register and or we don't want to register, we don't call it now, interestingly, we don't call it register, we call it something else because in a camp-like refugee situation, it's easy to register. In a dispersed situation, there are protection issues that come out. Yet when we first started on early on, especially those that haven't signed the 1951 convention, very complicated because um, they were considered guests in Jordan and in Syria, guests that sometimes were not wanted, and therefore if we started to register, the government can use these lists and then uh, deport the people or put them into prison. So trying to find out where these people are is quite complicated. Secondly, you have to give them something in order for them to wish to be um, profiled, as I think the word we're calling it. 
So if you want to profile this population to hopefully help them, you need to offer them something. And early on, there was very little that we could offer the, the Iraqi refugees in Jordan and Syria. Later what happened, early on, later what happened was um, the U.S. started to, in a very small amount, was going to resettle some of these people. So then there was a flood of people coming in to be uh, pro registered, then it really was registered, at the HCR offices with the hope of being resettled, but that was such a small, a few, uh, a very small amount of people that would ever be resettled. So there are issues regarding the estimating the size of the demographics and then the geographical distribution. And until you can do that, it's extremely difficult to which provide care, which is the most, provide support, which is the most important thing. This is just an example of what ACR did in 2007. Now these were registered Iraqi refugees, which were just a very, very small percent, less than 10% of the overall estimated population, depending on what estimate you have, looking at Yan and others. Because there was a, you know, possibly a much exaggerated uh, amount of people there. This is, is, you can't see it very clearly, but at least the idea was to show just in Damascus where the refugees, registered refugees were, and then compare it, you know, where the police stations, you can't see that there are health and in schools, etc. This is just a very rudimentary thing, but it's very important to do. But we still, these were registered refugees. We had no clue. If registered refugees were 10% of the population, where are the other 90%? If they were significantly more of the population, and the population is so small, which is was smaller than which was estimated, which is likely the case, we still only have those people that have registered. There were many other people that were not registered, and it was unclear what services they needed. The next big issue, um, and this is what I wanted to show you some examples here, but is estimating disease incidence rates. You know, it's, it, and if you have a, do you need a, denom a denominator, you need a population size to be able to deal with this. So refugee camps, no problem, any camps, no problem. For the most part, of course there are problems there. There's, in most uh, camp-like situations, IEP, refugees, population is exaggerated because they double count in order to get more, um, more food and more other things, which, which is normal. But here it's more complicated. So for the most part in urban settings, and I'm not coming here with by any means answers, but I have some ideas of where we're going, and I'd like to hear what you have to say. Um, the only thing we can do is pr proportional morbidity and mortality in, except if you do with broad population-based surveys, which are quite difficult because of uh, denominator issues. So you get a lot of proportional, proportional mortality of people coming into your clinics. Okay, now those are already very, very biased. They're helpful, but they're very, very biased estimates because they're, um, they're passive estimates. People have to get to the clinic. It's only those that are getting to the clinic. Maybe, maybe in, in, many, in, in the Iraqi situation, perhaps many people had money, at least at the beginning, didn't need to access the clinics where we were offering services. They had enough money to go to private clinicians. Or, uh, conversely, as time went on, maybe they just didn't know about it, they, there wasn't enough information, and they weren't accessing for other reasons. It's very difficult to get this information. One of the ideas we had which the governments didn't allow us to do was to put in sentinel sites. So to choose some of the, the, um, the health centers that existed uh, around the, the bigger population areas to at least then, um, for the government's hospitals and for the government primary health care clinics, put in some, pay for some, uh, some health care workers then to uh, measure, not measure, to document those that were refugees and those that were not. Um, but the governments wouldn't allow us to do this for various reasons. 